Hello everyone. Today we will be discussing about the humerus. Now the humerus is the bone of the arm. Okay. It is the longest bone of the upper limb. It has an upper rounded end. See, this is the upper rounded end of the humerus. Okay. If I see, if I place it like this, this is the upper rounded end of the humerus. And this is the lower flattened end of the humerus. Okay. The upper rounded end and the lower flattened end. And between these two end will be the intervening shaft. Alright. Now, the upper end is rounded. Alright. You can see this is the rounded upper end. Alright. Now, the lower end is expanded. Okay. Now, the lower end is expanded see from side to side and flattened from before backwards okay now it is flattened from before backward which means front to back it's flattened all right anterior posteriorly now the head is directed medially now let's come to the head see we please the head like this see the head is directed medially which means towards the body all right slightly upwards and backwards all right see if i place it like this you can clearly understand that this will be the medial side of the body all right because it's the right humerus and this is the head of the humerus see how is it directed it is directed medially okay to move, which means towards the body upwards okay for articulation with the scapula and backwards it's a bit backwardly directed see just imagine that there is a horizontal line over here okay which is connecting the lower end i mean in the plane of the lower end there is a horizontal line and if i draw a line passing from the center i mean from the center of the head now these two lines will be making an angle with each other i will come to it later just for the time's sake you remember okay uh, because uh, in that orientation you will understand that there is an angle between the lower end and the upper end i mean the head of the upper end, because it's backwardly directed all right now let's come to the head of the humerus now see this is the rounded articulating head of the humerus now this is the lesser tubercle okay this elevation over here is called the lesser tubercle of the humerus and this big round elevation okay laterally is called the greater tubercle of the humerus all right now between these two tubercles will be the intertubercular sulcus okay the intertubercular sulcus which is also known as the bicipital groove all right now between these two tubercles will be the intertubercular sulcus which is also called a bicipital groove all right okay. now this head of the humerus articulates with the glenoid cavity of the scapula this is the right scapula this is the glenoid fossa of the right scapula now the head of the humerus articulates in this fashion okay all right in this fashion all right now you can appreciate that the glenoid cavity is a bit shallower compared to the globular head of the humerus now why is it so the reason being the head of the humerus in this shallowed cavity can perform a wide range of movement okay okay now if it would be deeper the head might have I mean it would have restrictions around some movements so being it shallower the it increases the mobility around the shoulder joint okay so that we can perform a wide range of movement now this head of the humerus okay it's one third of a sphere okay this globular surface is one third of a sphere now it's much larger than the glenoid cavity all right now the line separating the head of the humerus from the rest of the portion of the upper end of the 
humerus is called the anatomical neck so this constriction i hope it's clear this constriction is called the anatomical head of the humerus okay this constriction near the neck all right now coming to the lesser tubercle in latin it means lump okay this bony elevation i mean protuberance it's called a lesser tubercle and this one right here laterally is called a greater tubercle all right now the lesser tubercle is an elevation on the anterior aspect of the upper end okay and the anterior aspect of the upper end it's an elevation now the greater tubercle the greater tubercle is an elevation that forms the lateral part okay this is the medial part this is the lateral part which means away from the body the greater tubercle is an elevation which will form the lateral part of the upper end now it's upper and posterior aspect okay the upper and posterior aspect all right the upper and the posterior aspect is marked by certain depressions okay see there are three impressions this one i hope it's clear let me focus the camera see this is one this is two this is three i hope it's very much prominent there are three impressions in the posterior and superior aspect of the greater tubercle now the upper middle and lower all right there are three important impressions now i will tell you in the later part of this video about the attachments okay now three important muscles are attached in this impressions now coming to the intertubercular sulcus i told you that between the lesser tubercle and the greater tubercle there will be an intertubercular sulcus which will which is also known as the bicipital groove all right now it separates the lesser tubercle medially from the anterior part of the greater tubercle all right now the lesser tubercle is a bit medially directed okay now the lesser tubercle is a bit medially directed from the anterior part of the greater tubercle so this is the anterior part of the greater tubercle all right now the sulcus has medial see this is the medial lip this is the lateral lip it has a medial lip and a lateral lip that represent downward prolongation of the lesser and greater tubercles see the medial lip see this is the prolongation from the lesser tubercle and this is the medial i mean the lateral lip which is the prolongation from the anterior part of the greater tubercle all right now the narrow line separating the upper end of the humerus from the shaft is called the surgical neck see this portion this whole portion may be referred to as the upper end of the humerus now this if if i just trace a imaginary line along this constriction okay which we, which is actually separating the upper end of the humerus from the shaft so this Uh, line will be demarcating the surgical neck of the humerus okay this line will be demarcating the surgical neck of the humerus now the reason for being it called so is that the chances of fracture is more in this region okay the humerus is more prone to fracture along this region in this area i mean the junction between the upper end and the intervening shaft all right now i told you about the anatomical neck of the humerus as well as the surgical neck of the humerus now there is one important i mean morphological neck okay of the humerus which is generally found in the young humerus okay so this will not be visible in this humerus which i have but it's basically present in young humerus okay now the morphological neck lies 0.5 cm below the surgical neck okay now the morphological neck lies below the surgical neck approximately 0.5 cm okay now it shows the 
position of the epiphyseal line okay it will show the position of the epiphyseal line which is actually an important anatomical region for the growth of the okay the long bones just like humerus so along this epiphyseal line these are the region of active growth of the bone all right now let's discuss about the shaft okay so this was the upper end of the humerus this is the lower end okay and between these two ends is the intervening shaft now the shaft is rounded in contour see it is rounded and it's more prominent in the upper half the rounded contour okay now the shaft is rounded in the upper half and triangular okay i hope you can appreciate this triangular shaft in the lower half of the humerus okay now the shaft has three borders and three surfaces okay now the shaft has three borders and three surfaces see this border over here is the medial border okay this is the medial border this is the anterior border and this is the lateral border of the shaft okay medial border anterior border and the lateral border of the shaft okay now coming to the upper one third of the anterior border so this is the anterior border okay now coming to the upper one third of the anterior border it forms the lateral lip of the intertubercular sulcus I told you that this is the intertubercular sulcus and the anterior border I mean as it ascends upward it forms the lateral lip of the intertubercular sulcus okay now in its middle part it forms the anterior margin of the delta tuberosity see there is a rough area roughened area in this anterior aspect okay this anterolateral aspect see this is called the radial tuberosity i sorry the delta tuberosity i hope it's clear see this is called the delta tuberosity this roughened ridge like area all right now coming to the lower half of the anterior border now this is basically smooth okay now the anterior border is less prominent in the lower half in the lower half of the shaft okay and it's less prominent it's basically smooth and rounded in shape okay now it's rounded now coming to the lateral border now the lateral border is prominent only at the lower end okay which is a bit sharp crest like see the lateral border is prominent only in the lower end i hope it's clear okay now and it's prominent in the lower end and gradually as it ascends upward it just gets faded and just moves into the posterior surface okay now it's more prominent in the lower half now here the lateral border will form the lateral supracondylar ridge okay so this portion right here is called the lateral supracondylar ridge of the humerus okay this is called the lateral supracondylar ridge of the humerus now in the upper part it is barely traceable up to the posterior surface of the greater tubercle all right now this is the greater tubercle c now if i just trace the lateral border from here now it just gets faded out till the posterior surface of the greater tubercle now the lateral border as i was telling you okay in the middle part in the middle part of the course before getting joined with the posterior surface of the greater tubercle it forms a radial or spiral groove okay i think you can appreciate there is a radial and spiral groove 
okay see i think it's prominent in the camera okay there is a radial spiral groove okay see actually i think it's clear now see the spiral groove okay so this is also called the radial or the spiral groove so it ultimately joins with the posterior surface of the greater tubercle okay now the upper part i mean the let's come to the medial border now the upper part of the medial border it forms the lip of the intertubercular sulcus okay this is the medial border okay starting from here now while tracing the borders it will be very much helpful if we trace on the lower end okay because it is more prominent now if we just trace it it just becomes the medial lip of the intertubercular sulcus okay see in the anteromedial surface all right so this is the medial lip of the intertubercular sulcus okay now the medial border just place it like this see the medial border in its middle part it forms a roughened area see this is the roughened area okay now there is a roughened area in the course which ultimately if we trace downward it forms the medial supracondylar ridge okay this is the medial supracondylar ridge all right this portion this is called the medial supracondylar ridge like this one this was the lateral supracondylar ridge this is the medial supracondylar ridge okay now in moving upward it forms the medial lip of the intertubercular sulcus all right now let's come to the surfaces of the humerus now i told you that there are three surfaces of the humerus now this is the anteromedial surface this is the anterolateral surface and this is the posterior surface all right anteromedial between the medial and anterior border anterolateral between the lateral and the sorry between the lateral and the anterior border this will be the anterolateral surface and this will be the posterior surface between the medial and lateral border all right now coming to the anterolateral surface the upper half of the surface see this is the anterolateral surface the upper half of the surface is covered by the deltoid i will show you the attachments in a pictorial diagram okay which will be helpful in the visualization okay the upper half of the surface is covered by the deltoid all right over here now a little above the middle part it is marked by a v shaped deltoid groove okay this is the deltoid groove or the deltoid tuberosity okay i told you that in the anterolateral surface there is the deltoid tuberosity which is generally bit triangular in shape okay now behind the deltoid tuberosity the radial groove is very much prominent see this is the this was the lateral border now it forms a radial or spiral groove in its course and merges with the posterior surface of the greater tubercle so it's just present behind this deltoid v shaped deltoid tuberosity okay now coming to the anteromedial surface see and the anteromedial surface is this one now i told you that it lies between the anterior and the medial borders okay this is the anteromedial surface now its upper one third is narrow it's basically narrow see it's narrower and forms the floor of the intertubercular sulcus now this is forming the floor of the intertubercular sulcus okay now a nutrient foramen is generally seen along this surface see it's well marked here this is actually some dirt i guess this is the nutrient foramen all right i hope you can appreciate this this is the 
nutrient foramen all right now let's come to the posterior surface so this is the posterior surface of the humerus all right this is the posterior surface now its upper part is marked by an oblique ridge see there is an oblique ridge in the upper part okay this oblique ridge now the middle one third is crossed by the radial groove see the middle one third is crossed by the radial or the spiral groove all right so this was pretty much about the surfaces now let's come to the lower end okay now coming to the lower end of the humerus now the lower end forms the condyles okay now this elevation in the medial part is called the medial epicondyle okay this bony protuberance medially is called the medial uh, epicondyle and this one laterally is called the lateral epicondyle okay now this lower end is expanded from medial to lateral okay and it's flattened from before backwards anterior posteriorly okay now it has some important articular and non articular parts first i will come to the articular parts which includes the capitulum see this is the capitulum okay in the lower end see this smooth rounded articulating surface now this actually articulates with the head of the radius okay let me show you the radius see this is the right radius which i have okay this is the right radius this is the radial tuberosity and this is the head of the radius okay okay this is the head of the radius now this articulates with the i mean the capitulum all right in this way so the capitulum in latin means little head okay now let's come to the trochlea now the trochlea is basically a pulley like structure okay which is present in the lower end because trochlea in greek means pulley okay it is pulley shaped it's asymmetrical because this half i mean the lateral flange and the medial flange are a bit unsymmetrical okay so it has two flanges this is the medial flange this is the lateral flange now the trochlea articulates with the trochlear notch of the ulna let me show you the ulna see this is the ulna the right ulna this is the trochlear notch of the ulna see this is the trochlear notch now quick points about the ulna this projection okay this is called the olecranon process okay this is the olecranon process of the ulna and this one right here is called the coronoid process of the ulna all right now coming back no so let me show you the articulation see this is how it articulates okay i hope it's visible see this is the olecranon fossa in the backward i mean in the posterior surface of the lower end see this is the olecranon fossa this is the olecranon process of the ulna so and this is the coronal process now it articulates in this fashion in the trochlea okay this was the articulation of the ulna now the medial edge of the trochlea it projects i mean you can just see it it's visible see it projects a bit down i mean it's 6 mm more than the lateral edge okay so it's 6 mm more than the lateral edge this results in the formation of the carrying angle okay now what's the carrying angle carrying angle is basically the angle between your arm and the forearm during various flexion and extension movements of your upper limb okay 
it's basically the angle between the arm and the forearm during flexion and extension okay now let's come to the non articular part so the capitulum and the trochlea were forming the articular part of the here lower end of the humerus all right now the non articular part includes the medial epicondyle the lateral epicondyle okay the sharp lateral margin okay which is called the lateral supracondylar ridge the medial supracondylar ridge okay on the medial side the coronoid fossa just now i showed you what was the coronoid fossa i mean it just articulates with the coronoid process okay during flexion see this is the coronoid process of the ulna see this is how it articulates the coronoid process uh, i mean the coronoid fossa this is the coronoid fossa now it is a depression just above the anterior aspect of the trochlea so this is the anterior aspect of the trochlea it's just a depression present above it now it accommodates the coronoid process i told you when the elbow is flexed now coming to the radial fossa this is the radial fossa i hope you can appreciate see okay let's appreciate this radial fossa because it articulates with the radial head i mean the head of the radius okay during the flexion all right now olecranon olecranon means the ulnar head okay i told you that there is a olecranon fossa which lies just above the posterior aspect of the trochlea so this is the posterior aspect of the trochlea and the olecranon fossa just lies above it now it accommodates the olecranon process of the ulna when the elbow is extended okay so let me show you again see this is the olecranon process of the ulna and during extension of the arms on the forearm c this is how it articulates it just lodges in the olecranon fossa all right and during flexion the coronoid process lodges in the coronoid fossa all right see so these were the non articular parts the let me repeat again the medial epicondyle the lateral epicondyle the coronoid fossa the radial fossa the olecranon fossa okay now let's come to the attachments of the humerus now before starting about the attachments it's very much essential to first have a review of the whole thing which we studied till now okay through this pictorial representation of the humerus now see this is the anterior aspect of the humerus see this is the head this is the lesser tubercle this is the greater tubercle this is the anatomical neck this is the intertubercular sulcus this is the lateral lip okay this is the morphological neck okay which is also demarcating the epiphyseal line all right now this is the medial lip of the intertubercular sulcus this is the lateral lip of the intertubercular sulcus now this is the medial border now this is the nutrient foramen which is present in the anteromedial surface okay now this nutrient foramen is projecting downwards which means the humerus is going upwards okay now this is the delta tuberosity in the anterolateral surface okay now just behind to it lies the radial or the spiral groove of the lateral border okay now this is the anterior border of the humerus this is the anterolateral surface this is the anteromedial surface this is the lateral supracondylar ridge okay it is the it is sharpest i mean the lateral border is sharpest in this region and this is the medial supracondylar ridge okay now this is the coronoid fossa which which is in relation with the coronoid process of the ulna during the flexion and this is the radial fossa which is in relation with the head of the radius during flexion this is the lateral epicondyle this is the medial epicondyle okay these parts constitute the non articular part of the lower end medial epicondyle lateral epicondyle coronoid fossa radial fossa capitulum trochlea and its medial edge 
now let's come to the posterior surveys okay now this is the head this is again the anatomical neck seen posteriorly this is uh, this is the surgical neck which just separates i mean it's present in a junction which separates the head and the shaft of the humerus okay this is the morphological neck i told you that it's present 0.5 mm below it okay 0.5 cm i guess now this is the epiphyseal line this is the oblique ridge this is the delta tuberosity this is the groove for radial nerve i told you that there is a spiral or radial groove present okay the lateral border is just continuing with it then it merges with the posterior surface of the greater tubercle all right now this is the medial border this is the lateral border this is the olecranon fossa which is in relation with the olecranon process of the ulna during extension this is the epiphyseal line of medial epicondyle okay these are the growing regions so it's called the epiphyseal line okay because the epiphyseal plate is present in there all right now let's come to the attachments now let's come to the attachments of the humerus okay now coming to the subscapularis muscle okay now the subscapularis muscle which originate in the scapula okay in the subscapular fossa now the multipinnate subscapularis is inserted into the lesser tubercle okay now it's inserted into the lesser tubercle see in this diagram as well see it's given it's inserted into the lesser tubercle the subscapularis muscle okay now let's come to the supraspinatus now the supraspinatus is inserted into the uppermost impression see there is a uppermost impression i told you that there are three impression in the in the posterior superior surface of the greater tubercle this is the first impression this is the second this is the third impression okay now in the first impression i mean the uppermost impression the supraspinatus muscle is inserted into it okay in the greater tubercle see the supraspinatus okay is visible in the anterior aspect of the humerus over here okay now let's come to the infraspinatus now the infraspinatus muscle is inserted into the middle impression of the greater tubercle so this was the first impression this is the middle impression so over here here will be the insertion of the infraspinatus see in this posterior aspect of the humerus it's visible this was the first impression for supraspinatus the second impression for infraspinatus and the third impression will be for the teres minor okay the third impression over here so this will be the insertion of the teres minor so i hope you remember from my scapula the video on scapula that the all these muscles i mean they originate in the scapula okay they, they originate in the scapula as well so they get inserted into the humerus in their respective anatomical position all right now coming to the head of the humerus now it's covered with the articular cartilage okay it's covered with the articular cartilage all right now i told you about the teres minor it's inserted into the lower impression of the greater tubercle now let's come to the pectoralis major now the pectoralis major is inserted into the lateral lip of the intertubercular sulcus okay see this is the lateral lip of the intertubercular sulcus and this is the medial lip of the intertubercular sulcus now the lateral lip of the intertubercular sulcus here will be the attachment of the pectoralis major muscle okay the pectoralis major muscle now the insertion is generally bilaminar okay the insertion will be bilaminar now coming to the intertubercular sulcus i mean the floor of the intertubercular sulcus here will be the attachment of the latissimus dorsi okay i hope you remember the latissimus dorsi which originated in the inferior angle of the scapula okay i think you remember it see the inferior angle 
so this was the origin of the latissimus dorsi all right so it was just a quick review now let's come to the teres major now the teres major is basically inserted i mean into the medial lip of the intertubercular sulcus okay in the medial lip of the intertubercular sulcus the teres major is basically inserted right now let's come to the contents of the intertubercular sulcus now the intertubercular sulcus will give attachment to the tendon of the long head of the biceps brachii okay and its synovial sheath now it will also give i mean i mean it also be lodging the ascending branch of the anterior circumflex humeral artery okay so these were the two important content of the intertubercular sulcus all right now i told you that the anterior border forms the lateral lip of the intertubercular sulcus okay and it also if we trace it below it also forms the anterior margin of the delta tuberosity the delta tuberosity is v shaped it has an anterior margin and a posterior margin now this delta tuberosity will be the attachment of the deltoid muscle see it's given in the diagram as well okay so this was about it now let's come to the insertion of the coracobrachialis see there is one important muscle known as the coracobrachialis which is inserted into the rough impression of the i mean the rough ridge like impression of the medial border when it's coursing in its medial i mean in the middle portion okay in the medial border so here will be attachment of the coracobrachialis okay Think you can appreciate this rough end area. All right. Now, if we look in the anterior view of the humerus, see there is one important muscle which is covering a major portion in the lower half of the humerus. Okay. Now, this is called the brachialis. now the brachialis arises from the lower halves of the anteromedial and the anterolateral surfaces of the shaft now a part of it it extends into the posterior aspect as well okay for so see it in the diagram see this is the brachialis okay it's i mean it's attached to the, both the anteromedial and anterolateral aspect it's covering whole of it now a part of it also extends into the posterior aspect see okay now let's see it in the diagram see i mean in the bone itself see this is the origin of the i mean origin of the brachialis muscle all right here a part of it may extend into the posterior surface as well all right now let's come to the brachioradialis okay now these three muscles are very much important coracobrachialis brachialis and the brachioradialis all right now the brachioradialis arises from the upper two third of the lateral supracondylar ridge so this was the lateral supracondylar ridge now from its upper two third the brachioradialis is originating all right now just adjacent to the brachioradialis will be present the extensor carpi radialis longus muscle okay the extensor carpi radialis longus muscle it is also present in the lateral supracondylar ridge okay and it's generally present in the lower one third of the lateral supracondylar ridge okay now you must remember that from the upper two thirds will be the origin of the brachioradialis and in the lower one third will be the origin of the extensor carpi radialis longus all right now now let's come to an attachment i mean an important attach attachment in the medial supracondylar ridge okay now in the lateral supracondylar ridge there were two important attachments the brachioradialis in the two third upper two third and in the lower one third will be the extensor carpi radialis longus similarly in the medial supracondylar ridge 
here will be an important muscle called the pronator teres okay now the pronator teres now specifically saying its humeral head the humeral head of pronator teres arises from the lower one third of the medial supracondylar ridge okay from the lower one third just like in the lateral one third we had the extensor carpi radialis longus radialis longus now from the medial supracondylar ridge in the lower one third we have the pronator teres all right now the superficial flexor muscles okay the superficial flexor muscle now of the forearm it arises by a common origin from the anterior aspect of the medial epicondyle okay now from the anterior aspect of the medial epicondyle here will be the superficial extensor muscles of the forearm which will help in the flexing i mean in the flexion of the forearm okay similarly the superficial extensor muscles of the forearm okay and supinator have a common origin from the lateral epicondyle okay so this is the lateral epicondyle this is called a common extensor origin okay now the common extensor origin will give origin to the superficial extensor muscles and the supinator now what is the supinator supinator helps in i mean supination see there are two important movements of the forearm one is supination and one is the pronation pronation is this way okay this is called pronation when you try to pick up some food and this is called supination when you try to put it in your mouth okay pronation supination okay so this was a bit important now let's come to the posterior surface of the humerus okay now the posterior surface there is one important muscle called the anconius now the anconius in greek means elbow that's why this region over here is called the elbow joint okay or the elbow now the anconius arises from the posterior surface of the lateral epicondyle see this is the lateral epicondyle and this is its posterior surface now the anconius arises from the posterior surface of the lateral epicondyle okay so this was a bit important next let's come to the triceps brachii okay now in the posterior surface you may appreciate that the major portion is covered by the triceps brachii okay the lower half and see the the triceps brachii has actually three heads now two of its heads mainly the medial head and the lateral head can be seen in the posterior surface of the humerus okay now first let's come to the lateral head of the triceps brachii okay now the lateral head of the triceps brachii arises from oblique ridge on the upper part of the posterior surface see this is the posterior surface and this, there here particularly in this region there is an oblique ridge okay now this oblique ridge will give origin to the lateral head of the triceps brachii okay so it arises from the oblique ridge on the upper part of the posterior surface now this oblique ridge is basically present above the radial group so this is the radial group i can i think you can see it in a diagram as well so this is the radial group above it the what is it the oblique ridge okay now while its uh, medial head i mean the medial head of the triceps brachii it arises from the posterior surface below the radial group so this radial group can help you in differentiating the lateral head of the triceps brachii and the medial head now above it will be the lateral head and below the radial group will be the medial head of the triceps brachii all right so this was an important landmark now let's come to the capsular ligament now the capsular ligament of the shoulder joint is attached to the anatomical neck except on the medial side okay where the line of attachment dips down by about 2 cm to include a small area of the shaft within the joint cavity okay now the capsular ligament where it is present it is attached to the anatomical neck except on the medial side where the line of attachment dips down okay for 2 cm approximately 2 cm to include a small area of the shaft within the joint cavity okay 
so this will uh, actually help in formation of the shoulder joint all right so this was an important thing now the line is interrupted at the intertubercular sulcus okay see this is the capsular line i mean the interrupted capsular attachment see i hope it's clear see this is the capsular ligament attachment of the capsular ligament now see in the anatomical neck see this capsular ligament is not extending up to the medial border see it just gets dips down by 2 cm okay so from here will be the attachment with the scapula let me bring it see from here the capsule ligament i mean the fibrous capsule see it dips down and from here it's attached so that also helps in the articulation of humerus and helps in its mobility in a broad perspective okay now that being said now i told you that it's interrupted by the intertubercular sulcus the capsular line okay now this actually provides an aperture through which the tendon of the long head of the biceps brachii i told you the contents of the intertubercular sulcus the long head, the tendon of the long head of the biceps brachii and the anterior circumflex humeral artery it lodges here okay now it actually helps in the i mean the passage of the tendon of the long head of the biceps brachii okay which leaves the joint cavity now the capsular ligament of the elbow joint is attached to the lower end along a line okay now let's come to the elbow joint now the capsular ligament see this is a capsular line okay see this is in its anterior aspect the capsular line i hope it's clear see this is in the anterior aspect this is in the posterior aspect okay now the capsular ligament of the elbow joint is attached to the lower end along a line that reaches the upper limits of the radial and coronoid fossa so first let's talk about the anterior region so here it lies okay the so it just marks the margin of the radial and the coronoid fossa so this is the radial fossa this is the coronoid fossa the capsular ligament just moves through this way okay now and posteriorly it marks the margin of the olecranon fossa i mean fossa so sorry so that these i mean these form the attachment okay of the elbow joint now now the capsular ligament also passes down the medial and the lateral epicondyles okay in this groove all right see i hope it's clear in the diagram as well so it just passes down see okay now coming to the nervous supply of the humerus now there are three nerves which are directly related to the humerus and therefore they are liable liable to injury now the first one is the axillary nerve which is present at the surgical neck i told you which one is the surgical neck the which which the line the imaginary line which demarcates the junction between the upper end and the shaft okay so along this here will be the axillary nerve okay at the surgical neck the radial nerve and the radial groove okay the radial nerve will be present in the radial groove okay and the ulnar nerve behind the medial epicondyle okay and behind the medial epicondyle will be the ulnar nerve now in this region okay if if we just i mean just uh, tingle a person over this region so the ulnar nerve gets compressed i mean that's why it gives a tingling sensation at this point okay so this was about it so so you can see in the diagram as well the three important nerves which i told you this is the axillary nerve okay in the posterior aspect of the surgical neck this is the radial nerve which passes through the radial groove and this is the ulnar nerve okay 
which is passes in the I mean the positive aspect of the medial epicondyle. Now if we press the lunar nerve, okay, okay, if we palpate it in at that region from the skin, the lunar nerve gets compressed and the person receives a tingling sen sensation. Okay, so over this region, all right. So this was pretty much about the humerus. I covered the general features and attachments. So keep watching until next time.